Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. That was a really long and pain painful introduction. I apologize. Okay. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. At the beginning of this talk, I would like to give you an admission. I didn't have much sleep last night, and the flight is over here from, I can't even remember where it was from. I'm a little loopy right now, so inshallah, if my talk doesn't make much sense, I apologize ahead of time. I'll try to be as co cohesive and organized as I can be. Uh, the topic, I, I don't want to just, and before I get into my topic, I might as well rant. So uh, the, the first rant I'll share with you is about MSAs. I love MSAs. I was part of the MSA. I was inspired to do whatever I do in my life and the career path that I chose and the direction I picked my life to go in as a result of the, the friends, the teachers, the, the scholars, uh, the insightful you know, uh, ideas that I received in the setting of the MSA. I think it's, it's just a fantastic institution and I don't think that it's, it should be undermined. That you know sometimes uh, there are some students, there are different kinds of students at the MSA, you get a lot of variety, right? And so you have some students that are extremely serious and they don't think the MSA is serious enough. And you have some students that are just to totally there for the social experience and they don't think that it's, you know, uh, it, it's too serious. They sometimes think it's, it's just, why are they always having halaqat and why are they always having study circles or whatever? They're just too uptight or whatever, you know? So you have these, all these different people. But the fact that they can actually survive the thing and, and live through it, I tell you, the people who graduate from school, they reflect and miss those days from the MSA. And they think back and they say, man, I had so many great friends and there was so much opportunity at that time, I wish I'd benefited from it even more now that I don't have that opportunity. Because as a matter of fact, I can tell you, um, you know, having, having graduated and moved on from the MSA about half a century ago, um, you know, uh, there is a social void after college. There's this really cool brotherhood and sisterhood that's, that happens on campus, in, you know, uh, conferences like this one. There's a really nice, you know, uh, sense of belonging. And all of a sudden, after you graduate and you go into the workplace, workplace, there's this like sense of loneliness, and it's a really hard to find a sense of, you know, belonging after that immediately. And you know, sometimes the masjid and some masajid are able to do that, but sometimes the masjid is not able to fill that space because our masajid haven't evolved to that extent yet. So I do advise you to take full advantage of this experience and really not underestimate the value of even the social interactions, even the hangouts, the barbecues, whatever. I don't even under, underestimate the value of them. As a matter of fact, to me, I, I think back and I say, probably the most life-altering uh, experience in my MSA days were the trips to the conference. I never attended any session. I don't even know what you people are doing here. I didn't attend, I, I attended the sessions to sleep. You know, like that guy over there. You know, it's like, that, that, that was me, okay? But it was just the, the conversations with brothers, just getting out of your mold, you're, you're not in your normal scene anymore, you're getting out and you get to talk and open up when you travel with people, you learn more about them, you get more annoyed with them than you've ever been before. And that's all part of, you know, just, uh, just growing. And that's, that's really where I made friends, friendships that, that even though we don't live anywhere near each other anymore, those same old friends, but they're still really the people I consider my genuine friends. The ones that I spent that kind of time with. And I make dua that Allah gives you those kinds of friends in your days in college, inshallah. Okay, so this talk about success. I want to, uh, like I said, I'll do my best to organize my thoughts uh, on this issue, inshallah. Uh, the first thing I want to talk to you about is success is something that every human being vies for. It, it's not something that's exclusive to Muslims or Christians or Jews. or It's not even a religious thing. It's something that every human being has generally aspirations for. And actually, sometimes there are people who are, you know, they have a psychological sort of uh, problem where they're not motivated to do anything, you know, and that's actually a, a sort of a disorder where they're not motivated to get up out of bed and go to work or find a job or go to college or do well in school and things like that. The, they're actually considered to have a, some sort of a disorder because the natural disposition of human beings is to want to accomplish things. And this is something that's put inside our very nature by Allah. It's put inside of us. The, the, the want to accomplish, the want to do, in the religious sense and in the worldly sense. We have, we're predisposed to do and accomplish. Like for instance, the people that uh, uh, you know, go through very difficult you know, transition and depression are retired folks. You know, they're working their entire lives and they feel like they've been productive. And all of a sudden, it's not like you would think, oh, I can't wait to retire. Actually, they get very depressed. 
because they feel like they were so productive all the time and now they're just sitting around. They want to do something. They want to be involved in something, you know? And this, this is a, something that is, you know, a healthy aspiration, a healthy sentiment that all of us are supposed to have inside of us. But beyond success, or, or, or thinking about success from an Islamic point of view, takes a little bit, we have to take a step back, sort of, right? And look at a grander picture. So that's what I'll try to present to you guys first. At the, before even success actually comes survival. And survival is something that all creation, animals share with us. We have the, the instinct of wanting to survive, right? The bird goes out of its nest and wants to go get you know, food for its young. And it wants to bring it back. And it wants to build itself a nest that it can protect itself from predators. It's high enough and it's secure from the wind and things like that, right? Ants make their, their, their place to survive, the holes in the ground, etc. So you have this instinct of survival that, that even precedes the want of success. But of course, human beings, we're unique creatures, right? We don't just want survival. We don't just want to survive. By the way, if we just had the desire to survive, you would not see the cities and civilizations and the infrastructure around us that you see. This is actually all a product of what? The human want of more. The human desire to accomplish more. Because animals, if we were just like them and we only had the motivation to survive, then none of this would be the case. We don't need technology to survive, contrary to popular opinion. You know, we've been surviving before technology too. We don't need cars to survive. The, all of these things that we see around us, you know, you don't need the extensive wardrobe that you have inside your closet to survive. There are people who survive without that too. And when, when we, as a matter of fact, when we see in the world people that are living at the level of survival, because there are some people, right? They're just barely surviving. That's what they're doing. We look at them and we say, man, that life is tough. They've got a difficult life. They're barely surviving. Or they're just living at that, that bare minimum subsistence level. That's all they're living at. How could they live like that? Because you've, acc you've accustomed yourself to certain luxuries and certain, you know, higher standards of living, what we call, right? And they are, in some people's worldview, a part of what success is considered. That's what success is considered. Now this is something, again, not limited to Islam. This is sort of a general thing. There's survival, and of course beyond that, we all want success. Now what does that success mean? What that success means for, you know, the, mass, the masses of people, most people, not all people, but most people, it actually means that they have certain hopes for themselves, and they're hoping to accomplish them within a given deadline. So by the time I'm 30, I hope to own a house. By the time I'm you know, 40, I hope to have this much savings. I want to have you know, children. I want to have this or that. You may have a different list of wants that you have. By the time I'm 25, I'd like to get married or even sooner. By the time this happens, this happens. You have financial goals. You have educational goals. You have career goals. And people have, even if you haven't written those out and you've timelined them, something's in your head about, yeah, I'd love to live over there. I'd like to have that kind of car, you know, you guys are driving by, the car, walk, car drives by, and you don't have to say it, but the fact that you waited until it disappeared from the street, and you just kind of just, your eyes wouldn't get off of it, you know, the, 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 the car that you really like, that just means that you have an aspiration to have that car. You're driving by a nice neighborhood, and you see a house by the beach, and you see a lot of those in this town, right? And, like, oh. and you, for a few seconds, you imagine yourself living there. It just happens. Why? Because these are parts of human aspiration. And most people have that. Most people have at least the aspiration to attain certain worldly things, you know, to acquire them in life, and they're working towards it. Like you guys are going to school, so obviously you have an aspiration to graduate on time or early. You have the aspiration to go into continuing studies perhaps. You have the aspiration to get an internship so you can get your feet wet and get into the workforce, etc., etc. You know, you're, you have some worries about the job market being tough nowadays. You have those things, you have those concerns. And you're working to, you know, to, to meet every standard and landmark and milestone of success that there is. And if you're Daisy, your life is particularly difficult because no matter what you accomplish, you will be a failure in the eyes of your parents. <laughs> Sorry, but, <laughs> you know, you know. I, mean, I, I, I think to myself, you know, uh, Salman Khan, not the actor, the guy from Khan Academy. And the guy from Khan Academy, Salman Khan, I imagine his parents telling him, why couldn't you just get a real job? Like, you know, <laughs> total Daisy thing to say, you know. So anyhow, so, you know, this is most people. Then there are some people, this is level two now, a step above. There are people who say, yeah, I want to accomplish some things for myself, but actually I'd like to do something for my neighborhood. 
I like to do something for my community. I like to do something for, you know, this, I see a problem in my town, or I see a problem in my vicinity, I see there's one, one area I'm concerned about, it bothers me, and I want to work towards that, I want to help that cause. And that, that may be an environmental cause, that may be, you know, you want to put a stop sign at the street, you think it's dangerous, you become an activist for that. You want to improve the school district, you know, people are activists, you notice that, right? People come to town, you may not go to town hearings, or attend board meetings at the, at the district or the municipality, but there are people who do that. There are people who go there and participate and say, we want, the, we want a neighborhood watch, we want this, we want the other for our communities. And they're, they're keeping an eye on the crime in the city and you know, children's safety and all this sort of stuff. People become activists for a cause. Now to them, success is not limited to themselves. They see success as some sort of improvement to society, right? Even in a limited framework, but it's something more than themselves. They live for something more than just themselves. And they find satisfaction in that. And by the way, accomplishing those things does not make them any richer. It does not make them you know, any higher status, socially speaking. But there's still a sense of fulfillment in doing something for others. And this is not most people, by the way. This is a minority of people that see themselves as wanting to participate in doing something beyond themselves. They're not just consumers for themselves. right? They want, they want to be contributors in society. And then there's this the, probably the most minute group of people. This is the third group of people. So I'm dividing people into three groups in this talk in the beginning, right? By the way, how much time do I have left? I have what? Did you say plenty of time? Did you just say plenty? 30 minutes? Okay. All right. Okay. Sit over there, and when there's five minutes left, just go like that. Okay. Don't give me the paper. No, 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 no. Okay. And the paper thing just throws me off. I forget every I forget where I am. I have complete amnesia when I see the paper. Five minutes. You know? And MSA stay staple, always put a smiley face on the five minutes. What is that? Where did you learn that from? Anyway. And there's one on yours, I know it. Okay. So anyway. What was I talking about? Something about Ibrahim Ali or something? What was I saying? How many kinds of people? Three kinds of people. Desis, Arabs. No, no. How many kinds of people? People that aspire to do something for themselves. They have aspirations. People that aspire to do something for community. And then there's the third and the, probably the, the smallest minority of people. People that believe in an idea. People that believe that the spreading of an idea will make the world better. People that believe that that idea is so powerful that if people are inspired by that idea, it will manifest itself in ways that they, they themselves can't even imagine. There are people that believe that there are the, the power of an idea like justice. If people become a believer in, for example, the concept of justice, that if they do become a believer in it, they will become activists in their own way. I don't have to dictate how they become an activist. They will, it will manifest in its own way. This idea is powerful enough to make the world a better place one step at a time. I may, not, I, may not, I may not see any change in the world as a result of the spreading of this idea, but I, it doesn't matter. It's like putting a seed in the ground and you're watering it. You don't see anything for a while, but you know something's happening underground. And when that tree does come out, it'll be far more powerful than a twig or a blade of grass. It'll be a tree. It'll be something substantial. And substantial trees take a while to develop the roots before they come out and really become strong. So they understand that they will live by this idea even if they don't see its manifestation. They understand this journey is long. And they understand that the gauge of success is not what they see with their eyes. It's not going to be what they see with their eyes. This is the, most, the smallest minority of people. And I'll give you the case study of these people. These are prophets of Allah. Alayhim salatu wassalam. They were inspired with the idea, with the knowledge that God is one. La ilaha illallah. And that that iman is supposed to lead human beings to hold themselves to a higher ethical character. And they are, they are ready to deliver this message to as many people as possible in their lifetime. And even if they don't see any change. If you were, for example, to ask, you know when in sales, in sales they have sales reports, right? I'm the CEO of an organization, and I know what sales reports are like, or progress reports, and metrics, and marketing, and things like that, right? So you have a six-month marker, a three-month marker, a year marker. How are we moving? You know, there's a chart of growth. 
If you were to have a sales report for Nuh alayhi salam, year after year, so how many people became Muslim? Right, 950 years, 900 years he's working at these people. <laughs> how many people became Muslim? It's a flat line. It's a flat line, there's a little bump over there and then it goes flat line again for another 100 years. It's a really bad sales report. There's no progress at all. If you look at the Prophet's own life, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Messenger of Islam, Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And you look at the first 10 years, 12 years of his work in Mecca. You can possibly argue as a, from a visible standpoint, there's what, a hundred people? People you can count easily? And, and what progress has been made? Things have gotten worse and worse and worse for Muslims as the years go by. But you know what it is? These prophets are inspired and committed to the idea of spreading something they know will bring good, even if it's a seed buried into the ground. And they're ready to give themselves for that idea. And they know that all other... Now, one of the other two aspects of success that I talked about, it was for yourself, right? It was for yourself and it was for your community. They understood that if you instill this idea, then people will have the right definition of what it means to have success for themselves, and they will have the right definition of what it means to have success for your community. It is the right idea that will shape all other areas of success. And people will really become successful then. They'll really understand how, how to see the world properly. It's a beautiful thing, this, this mission of the prophets. It's such a difficult thing though. It's so difficult. Because the idea that they, they came with is not a simple philosophy. It's not just a set of ideas that you can accept. I say, I accept these ideas, they make sense to me, and that's it, that's the end of it. It's not like that. These ideas are, and I, I don't like to use the word radical, but they are, they demand a huge transformation on behalf of a person. Not just in how they think and how they, but rather how they plan their life, how they're gonna live their life. The idea here is the ultimate success the ultimate success for you is to make your creator, your master, the one who loves you more than anyone else can ever love you, the one who cares for you more than anyone else can ever care for you, to make him happy with you is the ultimate success. And every other success you vie for in this world better submit to that idea. So your career goals should submit to that idea. Would my master be happy with you? Would he be happy with this? Would he want this for me? And, if you, if, and even if I want something for myself, and I'm not a person who doesn't want something for myself, and you're not someone who doesn't want something for themselves. We all want things for ourselves. You know, I want things for myself, I want things for my children, I want things for my parents. I want those things for them. But whatever I want for them, it's like I go back and say, well, if I want this for them, how can I make sure that they understand that this thing I want, like I want to buy my child a toy, right? Or I want to buy my parents a house or something like that. How can I make sure that, the, that they never see that the house itself is success? That's not success. The house is just a means by which they can live comfortably so they can serve a lot more. Because none of the things we have here are the reasons for which we're here. These are just means to a larger end. And the larger end is the pleasure of Allah. This is a very powerful concept. I know it sounds, oh uh, yeah, easy, I want to please Allah, that's it. No, 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 no. It's actually quite transformational. That actually means that if you are going to become, and some of you are going to go to med school, med school students, show of hands? A few of you, alhamdulillah, okay. So you guys aren't just, you're not just going to become physicians. You should be CEOs of hospitals. Why not? You should be running things. You should have like a networks of clinics that you're in charge of. You're gonna get there. And when you get there, you're, you don't say, yeah, well I've accomplished a lot. Actually, no, I accomplished this, so I can do something for Allah. I accomplished this, this was not the success. This was just what I wanted to enable, you know, give myself more and more capability so that I can put it to work for Allah. I didn't become this way for my own sake. There are people as an interesting example, and this is something the Muslim world is facing and suffering from. And it, we're not alone in this, but I'd like to beat up on ourselves first. We have this extreme problem of selfishness and self-absorption. I'm Pakistani from descent. I know some things about Pakistani society, for just to give you an example. In Pakistani society, if somebody is up and coming, if somebody is becoming successful, then there are people around him want nothing more than for his success to disappear. They can't wait for them to be torn down. 
It's just a thing. It's just a cultural thing. You don't, and, you know, and successful societies, you know what they do? They take failures and they keep encouraging them until they become successes. And what do some Muslim societies do? They take successes and they keep tearing them down until they become failures. Right? They can't see other people coming up. Why? Because there's this thing, if I can't have it, why should he? Everybody's out for themselves. Politicians in the Muslim world, you know, business people in the Muslim world, cheating the, the monies of people, corruption at, at rampant levels, all because of what? Because if there is some good coming, it better come which way? My way. And if it comes my way, it's not because I will do something else with it, no, it's for myself. It is for myself. I will amass so much wealth, stealing from the taxes, stealing from the monies of the poor, and I will make so many mansions and proper, I'll buy entire islands, I will do that not because I can even, even if I spend 10 minutes in every room I own, I won't be able to see all my rooms that I own, all the properties that I own, but that doesn't matter. I'm just here for me. And compare that to the sentiment of some others who care about their nation. I'm, I'm really inspired by this one story. Under, under Mughal rule, India was ruled by, by the Mughals, and, the, and one of the Mughal rulers, his son got extremely sick. And these are Muslim rulers, they lived in abundant wealth. And he's trying to get physicians to help out his, his son, and he can't find anyone. He can't find anybody. So he actually calls for a physician from England. And so the physician is imported from England, chubby guy, treats, the child, treats his son. After a couple of weeks, the son is improving. So the ruler is so happy with the physician, he says, you know, he's kind of chunky guy, so they say, weigh him. Weigh him and give him his weight in gold. That was how he was gonna, how he was gonna pay the physician. And the physician turns around and says, I don't want that gold. How about this, how about you open ports at your nation, the, the, the sea ports, for trade with my country. If you can do that for me, I'm happy. So this, which Muslim would do that? Like, let me, let me help my people, instead of making some money for myself. You think, you, you see? This is, the dif this is the difference. Somebody's thinking about someone higher than themselves. And I'm saying, and that person, that physician was a patriot. He, was a, he loved his nation. He wants his nation to prosper and engage in more trade. And that's his agenda. But for us, our agenda is serving Allah. It's even higher than a, an allegiance to people. And through serving Allah, we just want what's good for people. We just want what's good for people. What does Islam really want? And how, how are we going to give Islam this powerful idea to the world? That's what I want to share with you today in the last bit. If we can instill this idea, and if all of you can, can own this idea, I am confident that you are going to be successful people, inshallah ta'ala. So he, here's what it is. The Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, received revelation at what age? 40. At the age of 40. Before that age, was he involved in his community? Yeah. He was helping the needy wherever he could. He was helping the oppressed wherever he could. He was resolving some of the biggest conflicts that were happening in Mecca because people saw him as an honest, neutral party that will judge matters in a fair way. So people came to him when they had a, you know, a dispute. So he was considered the model citizen of his society for 40 years. And if there's one thing the Prophet had, والسلام, before even being titled the Messenger, he had this incredible reputation based on his character alone, not based on speeches, not based on talks or lectures, because he wasn't doing those, he was actually considered quite a shy person, but based on his work ethic, based on his concern for other people, based on his mercy to others, courtesy to others. And by the way, is he surrounded by a society where these sentiments are common? No. So he's surrounded by a very corrupt society, and he himself is, you could think of like one of the very few, if not the only nice guy. He, he's what that is in that society. And people like that are still around, and people think these people are naive. Why don't you be like everybody else? Why are you so naive? You think the world's a good place. People that do good, they don't accomplish anything, people tell them. They don't accomplish anything. And that's our messenger for how many? 40 years. And after 40 years, Allah decides to make him a messenger, right? But when Allah makes him a messenger, something interesting, Allah, in an ayah of the Qur'an, Allah swears by the fact that the Prophet ﷺ is committed, وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَى خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ That you are committed to an incredible character. You are committed to an incredible character. You know what we're learning? The validity of the message of Islam 
was rooted, the base of it was the character of the Prophet wasallam, his credibility, his character, his ethical standards that were already there before he became a messenger. And Allah quotes the first 40 years. وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَى خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ is one of the earliest revelations. One of the earliest. So he's not talking about the last year, six months. He's talking about his entire life. And he's saying, look at how amazing your character is. And with that credibility, he is calling to an idea. He's calling to something powerful. He's calling to la ilaha illallah. I argue today for Muslims, we talk about da'wah all the time. We want to make da'wah. But we don't talk about credibility. We don't talk about the right ethical standards on which we're supposed to stand without opening our mouth. So before we even people say anything, what do Muslims believe? What, which direction do they pray in? What are their dietary restrictions? What's with their dress code? Before asking any of those questions, anybody who knows a Muslim, the first thing that sh they should be saying is, as sadiq al-Amin. Those are titles for the Prophet ﷺ, not after he became a messenger, the truthful and the honest. The truthful and the honest. Those are titles not after he became a messenger, but what? Before he became a messenger, those two titles mean that he has credibility when he presents the message of Islam. This, you guys, the young, you are responsible to present the message of Islam to the world, but you will not be able to do so until we're standing on the footing of what? Of credibility of truthfulness and honesty. When you hold yourselves to higher standards, the world is corrupt. The industries that you are going to join have corruption. The medical industry has corruption. The engineering industry has corruption. The corporate environment has corruption. There are, th there are deals that are made. You know, if you're in the tech industry, there are people that are contractors, and they get $500 an hour contracts, or $400 an hour contracts. And they know that they could be doing this contract for a third of the price and a tenth of the time. But since there's a big corporation signing off on the contract, they inflate the hours. And you're in that company. And you just got your master's. And it's going to pay good money. Now this is legal. It's legal. But it's not ethical. And because you're a Muslim, you can't just sit by and let that happen. You can't do it. There are, there are you know, you're going to work as a, you know, in, in finance. You're going to work in, in the insurance industry and you're going to see the way loopholes are found to deny people their claims. You're going, to, you're going to see that. And you won't stand by it. You will not. You will fight against that in your industry. Why? Because you're Muslim, you have to hold yourself to a higher ethical standard. Yourself and others. Yourself and others. This is where people will see what Islam is. The talks, the lectures, the videos, that will just be back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. The one thing nobody can ever deny, the one thing that nobody will ever be able to discredit from our Prophet ﷺ is his ethics, is his character. And the one thing I can argue safely that the, the, the Ummah, the Muslims, are enti almost entirely missing is an ethical foundation, is a character foundation. We don't have ethical behavior in our MSA meeting. We don't have it in our masjid board meetings. We don't have it in our households. We don't even have ethical interactions when we're dealing, you know, with marriage proposals. We don't even have ethical interactions in marriage proposals. So the boy's family will lie about the boy and how he's a good, and they know he's got a drinking problem, and they'll still lie about it. This is highly unethical. This is this is and, and because they think that you know marrying the right girl it will fix all his problems. No, you're just going to ruin her life. That's what you're going to do. But this is what's, this is what's happening. This, this is the reality of Muslims. And we're in a sad state when it comes to this. So when I say we're going to go on a campaign to instill success into the Muslim youth, we want, I want all of you to be successful. Well, to have success, to build this tree, you've got to plant that seed. And that seed, is, and before we become people of la ilaha illallah, we have to become decent human beings. Common human decency, it needs to be revived. Courtesy needs to be revived. It is at the heart of Islam. What Allah Azza wa Jal tells us, what Allah tells us in the Quran about Islamic laws. I've, talked, I've said this in multiple talks now, but I, I think it's an idea worth spreading. And it's, and it's important for all of you to understand. When somebody sees, like Santa Barbara probably does not have a big Muslim population, right? So you see an unusual number of, let's just say exotic people now today on campus. Okay? So now when, when somebody else sees one of you outside and thinks, are they Muslim or something? 
When they see that, what do they see? What do they see about you that makes them think you're Muslim? Dress, perhaps? Maybe your prayer? Huh? Your what? Salams? Maybe swag? Okay. All right. I, um, that might be contestable, but that's okay. Uh, <laughs> you know? First, I thought you meant slacks. Is that an Islamic thing? I don't know. Maybe he's a California different fit. I, I don't know. So, <laughs> so, but anyhow, so they see these obvious things, right? Clothing, and maybe you work with somebody that you, you know, dietary restriction, prayer breaks. These are the things that are like, okay, this is a Muslim. This person is a Muslim, right? I mean, for me, at, you know, at the, at the security checkpoint, you know, Muslim. Okay. I don't have to be, I don't have to have a turban on and like be reading a mushaf or something. I just look like me and I'm like, hey, sir, special screening for you. Okay. So anyhow, these are the obvious indications that somebody is a Muslim. But the interesting thing is that prayer, as we pray it five times a day, was revealed a few years later. Alcohol prohibition was revealed about 10, 12, 13 years later when the Prophet moved to Medina. And the final prohibition after he even came 15, 16 years. Hijab, 16 years after the Prophet became a messenger, was revealed. Right? Clothing, or, uh, you know, uh, clothing guidelines, 15, 16 years. Dietary restrictions, at least a decade after Islam started being revealed. So, uh, and so what I'm trying to say is the things that we see obviously as markers of Muslims, like obvious indications that somebody's a Muslim, they weren't there for almost a decade or more in, among the companions. And these are the strongest Muslims, right? But immediately, from the very beginning of that message, from the beginning of that message, the Muslims in Mecca are totally different from the non-Muslims in Mecca. Not because of how they dress, not because of their food restrictions, not because they don't drink alcohol, not because of any of these things that make us different today. Not because of that reason. So one has to ask themselves, the greatest companions of the Prophet, the best of the best, why, how were they different from the rest of Mecca? Oh, once this idea came inside them, what is that idea, La ilaha illallah? What is that idea, Muhammad Rasulullah? It changed something about how they see success. It changed something about what they want to do in life. What they, want, what they love and what they hate. What they want to accomplish. What they want to live for and what they want to die for. What they will stand by idly and watch and what they will not tolerate. It made them a different people. It's, they saw the world differently. And if you just even spent two minutes with them, you would say, this person looks at the world differently than I do. Their worldview is entirely different. Their definitions of success and failure are entirely different. They are working towards something much different than what I'm working towards. I was hanging out with a Muslim teenager yesterday at a breakfast table, just me and him talking. And I said to him, hey, why are you alive? I know it's an awkward question, but I like those. <laughs> Why are you alive? I mean, he goes, what? <laughs> of course he said, what? So I said, you know, so, you know, why do you exist? What's your purpose? What's the purpose for which you exist? He goes, I don't know, like, live? <laughs> That's what he said. He was like, what do you want to accomplish in your life? What's the, what's the you know, uh, you know, uh, which, which video game did he mention? What's that first person shooter that's really popular? Yeah, be number one on Call of Duty online. That was his life purpose. What do you want to accomplish? Be number one Call of Duty? Okay. I want to be able to do 100 push-ups in a row. Cool. That's pretty cool. Pretty awesome goal. But you know what? That's not just one teenager. There are people that are in their 50s. And the greatest goal they see before them is a promotion. The greatest goal they see before them is a nest egg. That's it. That's all they see. There's nothing more. And why are you alive? Just to live. Party. Eat, sleep, poop, and die. <laughs> you know, that's it. That's all you're here for. But these Muslims, these guys in Mecca, I don't know, they live for some idea. And they want people to look, aspire to higher things. And they don't just want them to live for themselves. They want to hold themselves to a higher standard. They're not like us anymore. They become weird. You know? What's happened today is Islam is defined by the visible markers of Islam. And the original definition of Islam was an ethical worldview, was a moral worldview. 
And then the laws of Islam, the hijab, the halal and the haram, the sharia of Islam beautified that worldview. Now what we have left is an emphasis on the laws with a de-emphasis on the foundation on which those laws are built, the ethical foundations. It's just gone. It's, it's, or very little of it remains. And this is what your role is going to be. Your role is going to be to hold yourselves to a higher standard and therefore ask the world to hold themselves to a higher standard. That is what you're going to do. And the way you're going to do, every one of you is going to be a, a warrior in their own way. You're going to be an activist in your own cause, in your own, in your own field. That's how it's going to happen. So at the end of all of this, I just want to share with you how Allah lets us remain successful. Or how He keeps us, you know, because sometimes you can lose focus, right? Sometimes you, you know, for example, you guys join the MSA. In the beginning, you have these lofty goals, what you're going to do. About a year in, you don't even know what you're doing there anymore. It's just mechanical. You know, when you first started praying, it was a spiritual experience. Now it's just become cardiovascular exercise. You know, you, you do something for a while and you don't even know why you're doing it anymore. You lose sense of purpose. And you know, when you lose sense of purpose, you need something like a convention. You need something like a get together and say, okay, let's remind ourselves why we're doing this, right? You need to pick me up. And that pick me up originally is actually the Salat. The Salat forces the believer to stand in front of Allah and, and remind himself that one day his success or failure is going to be judged. Guide us to the straight path. Guide us because that day is coming where I don't want to be al maghdub alayhim, I don't want to be al dhadneen. I know you're Maliki Yawm al deen You know, I, I, I know I'm heading that way. I know I'm getting, I want a path, I want a journey. I realize that. And then you recite a portion of the Qur'an that's supposed to give you purpose. That's what it's supposed to do. That's what prayer is supposed to do. I personally see, and it's not, I don't think it's an oversimplification, a revival of prayer. A, re, a real revival of prayer in your personal life. And really engaging with the Qur'an as you should, you're guaranteed success. You're guaranteed success. Prayer itself does not guarantee success. But real prayer, real prayer, oh man, you are guaranteed success. قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَاشِعُونَ لَمْ يَقُلْ وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ يُصَلُّونَ He didn't say in Qur'an, the true believers have already attained success, the ones who pray. No, he said those, the true believers have already attained success. Those who when it comes to their prayers are incredibly humbled, overwhelmed, overpowered by the message that they themselves are reciting. What they're saying from Allah's words overwhelms them. They're standing in front of Allah talking to Him, reciting His word. And it moves them, it makes them think, you know, it, it inspires them. And that's what you have to do for your personal selves. Your salat is good, everything will be good. Your salat is no good, it will show in everything else. It'll show in everything else. Fix your salat. Nobody else will fix it for you. You have to fix it for yourself. That is the seed of success. And by the way, the rest of the, uh, the ayah, the rest of the passage, I won't explain the passage to you, I'm, I'm, I'm wrapping up, but I want to show you what this does. I'm arguing that salat, because it connects you to the Qur'an, gives you a sense of higher purpose, right? That's what I'm arguing. What does Allah say right after that? They stay away from useless activity. Why would somebody stay away from useless activity? Because they found themselves a sense of what? Purpose. You have a purpose. You have an exam tomorrow. You have a purpose. You have a project you have to finish. Are you going to just sit around? No, you're going to be working. Your friends are going to, hey, you want to get some pizza? No, I got an exam. You want to go play some ball? No, bro, I got a project to finish. You won't because there's a purpose in front of you. Salat gives you purpose, which leaves you not to be able to waste your time. Oh, why am I talking to the youth about wasting time? They don't ever waste time. You guys. I mean, efficiency.com, right? You guys are the, the example of efficiency. He says, if your prayer is fixed, what's the first thing that's gonna happen? You'll find yourself not wasting your time anymore. It's awesome. Then they're constantly working on cleansing themselves. When you stop wasting your time, you realize what you're doing, some things you're doing are no good, and you have to refine your behavior, so you start working on refining your schedule, and refining your activities, and becoming more and more productive. And they, they, they guard their privates, which actually means they guard their shame, because when you work, when you work for Islam and you have a sense of purpose, there's one thing that you cannot undistract yourself from, and that is temptation. That is attraction to the opposite gender. It is very, it's impossible for you to undo that. So Allah says, they take extra precaution 
to be decent and moral and guard, mindful and protective of their own dignity when they engage in the work. MSA students, MSA students, when you engage in MSA work, mind yourself. Don't be too chummy chummy with the brothers. Don't be too friendly with them. Don't do that. You have a higher purpose. You're distracting yourself. This is not right. She is somebody's future wife. You're like, well, what about me? <laughs> well, how many are you going to say that about, man? <laughs> Every 10 minutes, that one could work. <laughs> no. You also, stop making small talk. Have a sense of purpose. You know, I, I, Islam give, doesn't let you become like this. It doesn't let you have frivolous interactions. Not because in and of themselves they are evil and they lead to evil, that's true. But actually because you have something much more important to do. You don't have time for that. You know, there, there are schools where boys and girls, there's co-ed schools in America where there's no dating. Non-Muslim schools, there's no dating. You know why? Because the academic standards are so high and they keep them so busy that they don't even have time. They're so stressed with their studies. They don't have time for that stuff. They don't take off for Valentine's Day. They don't do that stuff. You know? The fact that you're engaged in something like that, or you're spending a little too much time looking at pictures on Facebook, or you know, becoming somebody's friend, or commenting this and that, you know what that means? You just haven't found purpose yet. That's what that means. Forget halal and haram. I'm not even here to talk to you about that. I'm here to talk to you about you. You're on a mission. You're forgetting you're on a mission. You know, إِلَّا عَلَىٰ أَزْوَاجِهِمْ أَمَّا مَلَكَتْ أَيْمَانُهُمْ فَإِنَّهُمْ غَيْرُ وَلُوِينَ وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ لِأَمَانَاتِهِمْ وَعَهْدِهِمْ رَاعُونَ These are the people that when it comes to making, they're entrusted with something and the promises they make, they watch over them. They are ethical people in their dealings. What did this, this whole transformation, they don't waste their time, they, they're not frivolous with the opposite gender, they, are, they keep their promises and they mind their trusts when they're entrusted with something, they really hold on to that. Where did this all begin? What was the thing that started this off? What refreshes them to constantly stay on point? Salat. Salat. Those are the people that they, when it comes to their prayers, they guard them. Because the prayers lead to everything else in success. So they go out of their way to make sure, I can compromise this meeting, I can compromise that game, I can compromise anything, I will not compromise my prayer. I can't come because I know what it means for my success in life. That's what it means. And then Allah says, These are the people that inherit paradise. The highest level of paradise. These are the successful people. These people are successful. There are thousands of dollars paid to seminars that are about success. Self-help seminars, success seminars, entrepreneur seminars. Where somebody says, I've made a million dollars in two months. Let me tell you how you can do it. Pay me $3,000 and come attend my success seminar. What he will tell you there is, I've been selling success seminars and that is my success. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But anyway, people go there, pay lots of money to go listen to how they can become a success. And at the end of the day, you know what he's saying? I need you to get up in the morning and I want you to pay attention. And I want you to focus and not waste your time. And stay on point. I'm talking like that because I live in Texas. Okay? That's how my barber talks, technically. Okay. He'll tell you just this stuff. Mind your time. Don't waste your time. Stay on target. Everything you do has to have a purpose, etc., etc. Allah already told us all of that. And you don't need a seminar. You just need salat to remind you, to refresh you. But if salat is real, if your salat is a joke, then none of this even have, begins. None of this begins. This process doesn't even begin. These are successful people. You, inshallah ta'ala, will be successful people if you make prayer a priority. If with that mindset, you read these ayat of Surah Al-Mu'minun. Because these ayat of Surah Al-Mu'minun, they really are a blueprint for success. I, as I leave you, I'll leave you with a rant again. And this one's a silly rant, but that's okay. It's an MSA, you guys can take it. So I've been, MSA, I've been involved with MSAs for many, 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 many years. And in MSA conferences, whether they're in the Midwest of the United States, whether they're in the East Coast of the United States, or in the West Coast, it doesn't even matter. There's one common thing. So they make these elaborate programs, right, for the speakers. And they have these really, like, 
funky titles for the talks, like Blueprint from the Divine, <laughs> right? They have these titles like that. Like, do you talk like that to each other? Hey, bro, how's the Blueprint from the Divine? <laughs> oh no, it's pretty good. <laughs> like, you know, you don't do that. And then they write like an eight paragraph description of the talk, right? And then they send that to the speakers, different speakers. This is the talk you're giving, it's called Blueprint for the Divine. <laughs> and and, and if, if the speaker was to come up and just read the description, their time would be over. <laughs> They've written the entire speech for them. And what's funny is for the last 20 years, I don't know a single speaker who actually reads that stuff. <laughs> we just come and do whatever you want. Just, just, <laughs> it's been like that. <laughs> So, so, so my thing is, <laughs> um, my suggestion, it's a humble suggestion, you don't have to take it, because uh, I'm saying you could continue to write Blueprint for the Divine, or the, you know, I don't know, I, don't, I can't even remember some of those titles, but they're really good, sometimes I write them down to just say to my kids, just to see what they'll say, what does that mean? I don't know, that's weird. Is that English? <laughs> you know, that's what they say. But I, you could keep things going the way they are, and that's fine, that's totally fine, because speakers will continue to come and do their own thing. That's totally fine. Or you could start actually putting normal titles. Like, how do we become successful? Oh, yo, yo, hand, okay. Then the question is, time's up, yeah. Okay, how do we become successful? Or like, Islam stuff with Brother Noman, or, you know, like, keep it simple, you know? <laughs> you know, something about, something about marriage or something. It's okay, just use titles that people actually use in life instead of these elaborate, overly descriptive, literary masterpieces that you write that, you know, take, you have to, like, uh, uh, analyze them in literature class, etc. So you don't have to do that, inshallah. But I, I'm not, not dissing the efforts of the person who wrote the description. Hey, don't feel bad. Totally. That's not, not mad at you. But it's, it's been going on for 20 years. It's not going to stop anytime soon. By the time you have a board meeting to address this issue, you will all graduate. And the next batch will come in and they'll do it over again. So it's okay. This is totally fine, inshallah. I hope you guys uh, were able to take in some of the ideas that I've tried to present uh, today, inshallah ta'ala. But as a just, just summing it up, you guys, there's a, there's a huge expectation from you. I know, I know, I know. Don't give me the paper. Don't give me the paper. Okay, okay. All right. There's a huge expectation from you. Let me tell you something. American Muslim youth, specifically American Muslim youth. Recently, I've started traveling internationally. One of my first uh, uh, you know, uh, targets was the UK. And I saw maybe in one trip, in maybe five days, I saw maybe 5,000 Muslims in the UK. I, I, I spoke at London, I spoke in Birmingham, I went even to Glasgow in Scotland. That was pretty awesome. Uh, but anyway, so I, I, I met lots of Muslims. And I, let me tell you something. We are in a unique position in the United States. The entrepreneurial opportunities, the educational opportunities, the, 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 the ni'mas, the blessings that Allah has given you, and the opportunities that Allah has given you are unparalleled anywhere in the world. And as a matter of fact, the eyes of Muslim youth are on you all over the world. What will you accomplish? What will you accomplish? You are not just living for yourselves. I know we're living in the ultimate consumer society. We are. We are living in the Amazon.com, Walmart society. That's what we're living. But you know what? You have to internalize that you are living for more than yourself. That Allah has given you more than so many others who are much more intelligent than you, much more talented than you, but Allah did not give them the opportunities He gave you because He expects great things from you. Not just for your own career, but for His deen, for the world. You're gonna be the entre entrepreneurs. You know, you're gonna bring reform to so many things. You're gonna make the world better in so many ways. And all of it inspired by that prayer you do every day. That's what you're gonna do. And you really have to ask yourself, how are you going to accomplish that? How, what are you going to give the world? What is Allah going to do through you? Every one of you has to have that introspection. You, you are not the kind of people that are going to go to a guidance counselor in your junior year in college and say, I don't know what to graduate in, I don't know, I'm not sure. Not you, you have purpose. You've had purpose since 8th grade. You are driven. That's what you are, because you're people of La ilaha illallah. 
May Allah Azza wa Jal make you exceed the expectations that I and so many have of you. May Allah Azza wa Jal make you the pride of Islam and through you show the world what Islam really looks like and how it can beautify this world. Barakallahu li wa lakum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.